because during the month of Ramadan, he read Isaiah 58. This is what the Lord tells us about true fasting. Isaiah chapter 58. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why have we fasted and you didn't see it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you did not take knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast you seek your own pleasure, says the Lord, and you oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose, a day for a man to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a rush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke. Is, not, is it not to share your bread with the hungry? And bring the homeless poor into your house. When you see the naked to cover him. And not to hide yourself from your own flesh. Then shall your light break forth like the dawn. And your healing shall spring up mightily. Your righteousness shall go before you. And the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. If you take away from the midst of you the yoke, the pointing of the finger, and the speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness, and your gloom be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire with good things, and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden like a spring of water whose waters will fail not. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Let us pray. O oh God, our Father, we come to you in the name of our Savior Christ. And we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts may be acceptable unto you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. You know, Baptists traditionally are not a liturgical people. We don't follow the church year very much. But in this period of ecumenicity, we've begun to appreciate one another and learn from other traditions. And this is the first Sunday in Lent. Lent is usually associated with the spiritual discipline of fasting. You know, there's the common question, what have you given up for Lent? Or more often the statement, I, I've given up eating sugar for Lent. In the history of the church, this past Wednesday was called what? Ash Wednesday. And we saw many of our friends from the Anglican, Catholic, Orthodox, or Lutheran tradition, even some Methodists, putting a cross made of ashes on their heads. Sometimes we forget, however, where these ashes came from. The ashes used for Ash Wednesday come from the burned palms of last year. Those who are waving palms on Palm Sunday are the ones the next week were saying, Crucify Him! Crucify Him! You see, religious rituals and symbols are supposed to be external reminders of an inward regeneration. But sometimes we misunderstand the rituals and we worship the ritual instead of that which it represents. And that's true in many aspects of life, isn't it? We go through many rituals, but we miss the point of what it's all about. 
When the British colonialists were in a country in Africa, the people remembered a ceremony that they had every morning. They saw all the British troops march out and they would raise the British flag and they would all salute. Well, when the British went home, they thought that was part of the Christian tradition. So there's a little group of Christians that every morning march out, have worship, and they raise their flag. It's tradition, but it's lost its meaning. We told you, of course, that we're beginning Lent, aren't we? Which is associated with fasting. And the Bible talks often about fasting. At our Wednesday prayer meeting, I was surprised when we talked to, and, and, and you need to know, we're having a wonderful time at our Wednesday prayer meetings. We had 45 last Sunday, last Wednesday. It was a beautiful experience where we, we asked them, have any of you ever fasted? And we were amazed at the number of people that raised their hands and, and said they fasted. For some, it meant the discipline of contemplating God. Stop eating and listen to God. For others, it was deepening their spiritual life. For others, it was an opportunity to be more receptive to God's leading, of listening to God. Did you know that many people, before they go to a concert, fast because your body is more receptive to the music? Sometimes we eat so much we don't listen to God or don't listen to one another. But as someone also said, it could be a different kind of fast. A fast of not watching TV. Now that would be something for Americans, wouldn't it? Maybe you should fast from TV this Lenten season and pray a little more. Little prayer, little power, much prayer, much power. Jesus doesn't prescribe fasting as an ordinance or a sacrament of the church, but he, he implies it and he speaks often about it. At the beginning of his own ministry, remember Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights and he went into the wilderness. And later in his, in his ministry, though, he was criticized by the Pharisees. They said, John's disciples, they fast and pray, but your disciples don't fast. And Jesus says, can you make the guests of the bridegroom fast while he's with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken away, and in those days they will fast. You see, after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, after Jesus ascended into heaven, then the disciples wanted to be near to him, and they, they, they learned fasting. It became a, a spiritual discipline in the early church. And fasting is common to many religions. The Muslims, uh, during Ramadan, they fast from sunrise to sunset. But what does it mean to fast? Isaiah 58 spoke about that. We just read it. It's a prophetic protest against ritual that's lost its meaning. It's a prophetic protest against a fast that has no meaning to the people. What God is interested in is, is a change of heart. He wants to know if your fasting is bringing you closer to Him or is it making you more angry. Let's listen to the prophet Isaiah again and, and see what he tells us about Lent and about fasting. You see, Israel's problem in the prophetic scriptures and all the prophets is that they're a nation of whiners. They're always complaining. They mumble and they grumble and mumble, mumble in the wilderness. Remember, they complained to Moses about being in the wilderness. They yearned for the flesh pots of Egypt. They complained about the food. They complained about their living arrangements. They complained about God. They were whiners. Have you ever been around a whiner? Have you ever taken a tour group around the world? I mean, you, you really get to know what a whiner is. They don't like the bus. They don't like the food. Their room is not good. They can't understand the guide. They didn't see what they thought they were paying to see. And it's so bad that other tourists just don't want to sit next to them. Nobody likes a whiner, do they? We even have whiners in the church, don't we? God has a conflict with Israel. In fact, he tells the prophet, let everyone know about it. God says, I'm, I'm going to tell the whole world. You gave this great prayer on what you were doing. Now listen to this. Blow the trumpet. Shout it loud, says God. I want you all to hear about this Israel whining again. Tell them about their sins. Listen to their rebellion. This is the problem, says Isaiah. The people appear to be very religious. They're fasting and acting as, as though they were a righteous nation. They're acting as though they were obeying all of God's commandments. Uh, they, they, they seem to give the appearance of being happy to go to the temple, of being very religious. Indeed, they, they even say that they're eager to come near to God. But one of the problems we learn from the prophets with so-called religious people 
is that they appear self-satisfied with themselves. Remember the man in the temple, oh God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. They're arrogant by their ritual observance. They're happy that others, they're not like others. But you see, God, God knows what's going on. Can't hide from God. God knows your heart. And what was Israel's complaint? They began to question the purpose of their rituals. They wondered out loud, what's the use of all this fasting? God doesn't hear us. We fasted and, and we don't even see Him. We've humbled ourselves and you don't even know, God, that we're humbling ourselves and we're fasting. Don't you see how good we are? Why aren't you there? How many people have voiced their complaint against God? Where are you, God, when it hurts? Where are you, God, when I'm in trouble? Why didn't you save my little boy from the accident? Why didn't you hear me when I prayed for all my problems? Why didn't you give me that new car or new house? Why didn't you notice my attendance in Sunday school, my sacrifice in coming to church and to work for the Lord? Lord, why didn't you hear me? You may not say that out loud, but you know, sometimes in the deepest of your heart you might be. And you know, we have in America, in the intellectual world, what's called the new atheism. They have similar complaints. How can there be a just God when, when there's so much injustice? How can God be a God of love when, when there's so much pain, so much war, so much poverty, so much inequality, so much greed? Where are you, God? Are you, are you listening, God? I remember when I studied in Germany with an American friend, and he was a Methodist, and you know in the olden days, in the 50s, when you went to Sunday school, if you went all year and didn't miss a Sunday, you got a little, a little metal badge. You remember that? And then if you went another year, you got another one you hung down with. 14 years, he hadn't missed church. He had a whole, he looked like a battle general, you know, he had all these rows of little badges for going to church and not missing it. And then at 11 o'clock, you heard the bell rang. It's time to church, and you ran to church. But you know what? It was the people leaving church. Because in Germany, they don't start at 11 o'clock, they start at 10 o'clock. And the amazing thing is, his whole world fell apart. He became an atheist. He stopped going to church and he said, now I'm free. Was he really free? Or did he have a misunderstanding of what true worship was all about? He was going to church just to keep up appearances. He had to earn that little medal. You see, this is the problem with Israel. They complained to the Lord that they were fasting. Oh, Lord, we fasted, we humbled ourselves. Didn't you see us? It was as though they had worn a bed of nails, and though they'd punished themselves so God would notice how religious they were. But alas, God seemed so far away when they wanted him to be near. What kind of a God is this? So this is Israel's complaint. They fasted and God didn't hear. They humbled themselves and God didn't notice it. And these are, they think, legitimate complaints. But Isaiah the prophet presents this, this conflict as though it's a court case. All right, Israel, you speak. All right, now we're going to hear God speak. Now listen to God's side of the story. So, Israel, you don't think I don't see you fasting, God says? You didn't think that I saw you humbling yourself? Indeed, I did. But then what I really noticed was after all of these rituals you went through, nothing changed. Indeed, after you, after you fasted and sought your own pleasure, you went about life as though nothing changed. Your own pleasure was your goal after your fasting. I saw what happened to you after you fasted. You, be, you went to work and you began to fight and quarrel. You didn't seek the good of your workers. Indeed, you oppressed your workers. You hit them with a fist. That's what the prophet says, God said. What good is all your religion if it doesn't change you? What good is all your fasting if you don't seek the good of others, but you seek your own pleasure? You see, God tells the people of Israel, fasting like yours this day will not make your voice be heard on God. Do you really think that that's the result of this type of fasting? You're going to the temple and you're bowing down and doing all your riches. You're like a blade of grass, you know, in the wind. So you think that's fasting? Do you think, do you think it's dressing in sackcloth and putting ashes all over yourself? Including Ash Wednesday, is that what you call fasting? Do you really think this is what pleases God? Much has been written about young people who leave the church. They're called church leavers. 
And religious leaders in Boston are very worried about that. You know, Boston used to be 51% Catholic, but today it's 28%. Used to be 29% Protestant, but 18%. We're basically a pagan society. Our Sunday schools are empty. Families are broken up. There seems to be no social cohesion. And what's the reason? Is it because the church has become irrelevant? Is it because the word's not being preached? Could it be that in trying to relate to society that we become so politically correct that we no longer have a word from the Lord, but rather we have a word from political correction and from the media? I remember several years ago in Union Seminary in New York City, a student read from the Bible. And he called it a word from the old word. And then he read from the New York Times and he said it was uh, the new word. But you know, he got it all wrong. The New, the New York Times is the old word of deceit and treachery and greed and anger and all the sins of humanity that we have in our papers every day. We don't point to modern culture and say that's what we imitate. We point to Jesus Christ. And during this Lenten season, we're preparing ourselves for the cross. We're preparing ourselves for the way of Jesus and the cross. We don't point to ourselves. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all humanity to myself. And that's why we're here. We're here to lift up Christ. And that's why we give you an invitation every Sunday to renew your faith, to lift up Christ, not to lift up ourselves. If the church is only show, if it's only lots of words without the word of God, if it's only noise without content, the world's not going to listen. In my fair lady, you know, the, the young lady says, don't tell me you love me, show me. Isn't that the problem? This is God's complaint against Israel's fasting. It's egocentric and it's not theocentric. It's God's protest against the fasting that centers around me and not God. It's a showing religion with no content. And so the Lord then tells Israel, do you know what fasting is? Do you know what kind of fasting I really want to you? Well, well, this is what you need to do if you fast. It's very hard to read this when you realize this was written thousands of years ago. But this is the prophetic protest of Isaiah that applies to us as well as did the people of Israel. Is this not the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke, is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own relatives? That might be the hardest part of it all. Wow, this, 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 is, this is a protest. Not as powerful for all governments and for all of us to hear that it was thousands of years ago. It applies to us today. This is the fast God says that I want you to do. First, to free those who are wrongly impressed, in prison. Thousands all over the world are in prison today for their faith. To proclaim freedom to the oppressed and to stop oppressing those who work for you. That's for the employers. To share your bread with the hungry. That's for you and me. To bring the homeless into your house. To give clothes to those in need. To help your relatives in need. Now that's really something that the world will take notice of. And that's why Mother Teresa was so admired. That's why Martin Luther King was part of the biblical protest movement. You say you love God and you're sending missionaries to Africa, but you don't want Africans in your church. What is this? You see, that's why the great missionary movement of the 19th century was successful because it was always the word plus action. That's the problem today. We have one conservatives preaching and the liberals doing things, but they never get it together, and so it's never a spiritual word. But it was William Carey going to India and saying, stop burning the widows. It was Timothy Richard in China working for the underclass. It was Lottie Moon who was feeding the poor and even starved to death and saving the people by, by giving her food away. You see, one of the great tragedies of the church in the late 1920s was the separation of, of the liberals and conservatives. The liberals said we need to give more bread to the hungry, and the conservatives said we need to preach the living word. But you see, it's not either or. It's both and. As the starving person said, my stomach is growling so much from hunger I can't hear your words. 
You see, that was the beginning of the protest movement of this church, this church in 1839, when it was fighting the great social issue of today, slavery. That was part of our heritage. William Lloyd Garrison, the abolition movement began here. Nobody could be a member of this church if they owned slaves. Today there are many competing social issues confronting the church, but certainly one must be the great and growing cleft between the rich and the poor. The fact is that in 1950, a leader in industry may be made 30 times more than his workers. But today, leaders in industry are grabbing 400 times more than the average worker. It's not only wrong, it's a sin against God, and we have to protest against that. And don't think that God's eyes are closed. Like the people of Israel who were fasting and wondered why God didn't answer their prayers of fasting, so too that in the day God looks down upon America and says, what are you doing? I'll never forget when I was a missionary in Romania. An old Baptist pastor said to me, you know, there was a neighbor next to our Baptist church. And by mistake, we built six inches on his land. And he took us to court to get all of our property. And the old pastor says, you know, he was suffering under communism. He says, sometimes you Americans remind me of that. You're fighting for those six inches and one day you might lose it all. We need to listen to the prophetic protest of Isaiah. God demands justice of his people and of nations. It's not my word. I'd rather be having a happy time in Cape Cod than coming in here every Sunday and enjoy everything, but that's not what it is. We've got to do what the Lord wants, and justice. It's the word of the Lord. There are positive and negative consequences to our behavior as nations and individuals. Of course I'm an American, and I love my country, but real love means to be concerned about judgment and to be concerned about correction of one another. Someone once told G.K. Chesterton in England, my country right or wrong, he said, well, that's like saying my mother, drunk or sober. My country, right to keep it right. My country, wrong to make it right. That's the purpose of true fasting, to change our ways, to change our behavior. So there's consequences then to true fasting. There are logical consequences that we teach our children. If you touch a hot stove, you get burned. Don't touch the stove. If you cross the street without looking, you can be hit by a car. If you smoke, you're going to get cancer. On the other hand, there are positive consequences. If you eat all your food, we tell little boys and girls, you'll get your dessert. If you study hard, you go to college. If you're a good worker, you'll get promoted. There are logical consequences in life. But how can we understand the mind of God? God is holy and just. He demands righteous actions from you and me. And through the prophet Isaiah, the Lord tells us there are consequences of true fasting. I want you to fast, but not the way that we're doing it. Then I want you to do real fasting. If you do these things, if you seek justice, if you feed the poor, if you clothe the naked, you pay just wages, then your salvation will come like the dawn. Then your light will bring forth and your healing come quickly. The prophet says, then when you call the Lord, he will answer. You shall cry, and I shall say, Here I am. Aren't you waiting in your life to hear God say, Here I am, I love you? You see, all those things that Israel complained about will now take place if you really fast. If your walk is like your talk, then I'll hear you and I'll see your fast. Just stop pointing the finger. That's what Isaiah said. Stop pointing the finger and see your fast. Just stop that, and then your light will shine in the darkness, and your gloom will be as that noonday. There was a wealthy lady in New York City many years ago who went to Harry Emerson Fosdick, who was pastor of Riverside Church, and she told him all of her problems. She had all of the world could offer. Dr. Fosdick took out of his drawer a list of ten poor and needy people, and he gave it to her, and he said, visit these people and come back and see me tomorrow. She came back a month later and her life was changed. Instead of being so concerned about her own problems, she lost herself in helping others. She feels sorry for herself and maybe it's because you're not feeling sorry for somebody else. 
The Lord says, if you truly fast, then light and healing will come to you. Isn't that what we all need? We need the light of God to penetrate the darkness of our hearts. We need the light of God to show us all the evil that we've suppressed and hidden, which is often heard by other people. We need the light of God to shine in our lives. And if we allow the light of God to shine in our lives, then you will, and I will experience healing. And the healing of God is not other than the salve of God in our lives. The word salve, that ointment which heals, is what we have in the word salvation. It's the ointment of God on our sin that forgives us and heals us and makes us a new people. The Lord said, if you truly fast, then light and salvation is going to come to you. You know, that's what the psalmist meant. He said, you anoint my head with oil. You put salve on my head to give me salvation. If we truly fast, then we will experience the healing power of God in our lives. Then we'll be free of fear and anxiety. Then we'll be free of jealousy and anger. Then we'll be like a water garden, Isaiah says. My wife loves a garden. You know what it means, a water garden? Stand out there all day and hose it down? I didn't like that. But you know what? Plants began to grow. Flowers came up. If you don't water something, the garden is not going to grow. But God says, if you really, truly fast and do what I tell you to do, then you're going to be like a water garden. You're going to be beautiful. Bishop Neal was a missionary bishop to India, and he told him that all the fields would be dry and parched and it looked terrible and it didn't look like anything would grow there. But then they would open the irrigation gates and the water would come in and suddenly in this fallow ground and dry ground, little shoots of rice would grow up and flowers and, and you'd have a green field. Soon the, the irrigation brought water and that's a wonderful picture of what can happen if we truly fast. You might be spiritually dead, spiritually dry and arid. You haven't prayed for years. You don't feel the presence of God in your life. Open the gates and let the Holy Spirit come into your life. Let the water of God flow in your life and then you'll be like a garden that's watered. And you'll have a new name. Repair of the breach. The restorer of the streets to dwell in. What a wonderful name. To be able to repair the broken chasm between people and God. To make the streets peaceful and calm. God knows we need men and women to repair the breaches of our broken family ties and to make our streets peaceful again. Jesus reminds us again, though, of what true fasting is all about. He said, Don't brag about it. True fasting is a secret to you and God. When you fast, don't look dismal like the hypocrites, for they love to disfigure their faces and, and look and look at I'm fasting. When you fast, anoint your head and, and wash your face and, and, and then your fasting may not be seen by men, but your father who sees it in secret, he'll sees it and you'll have reward. You know, we're, we're daily confronted with true fasting and false fasting. In Jesus Christ, God has revealed himself as the true model for all humanity. And Jesus changes the world by dying on the cross. And all the dictators of the world want to bring change the world. They want to change the world by the sword, don't they? But Jesus said, put back your sword. And the true fast during this Lenten season is one that prepares us for the way of the cross, for laying our lives down for one another. During the communist period, I remember when I was a missionary in the Soviet Union, I, I, I was at Zadors. Zadors gets a an old seminary outskirts of Moscow. And all the World Council of Churches leaders with their big pointed hats and their big robes were there and giving boring lectures on the history of their church which put everybody to sleep. The Baptists were a poor church, didn't have any theologians, they couldn't go to seminary, they weren't allowed to go to school. So they brought a little choir of boys and girls. And they sang this song which meant more than all the lectures. The little boys and girls said, when you go to heaven, this is what they wrote, when you go to heaven, the Lord will ask you two questions. Did you love me? Or did you share your bread? You see, that's, that's the question of true fasting to each of you today. And what's your answer going to be? Did you love me? Did you share your bread? Were you kind? Were you generous to one another? 
I would encourage you this Lenten season, don't tell me, don't tell anybody. But fast. Maybe give up television. Give up something that you like to do and use that time for prayer. So many noises are blocking out God in your life. You need the true fast of listening to the Holy Spirit in your life. You can't hear God because there's too many noises. You need to fast. And you need to concentrate on Christ. Because the end of all of our fasting is to have communion with Jesus Christ. That, that's why we give the invitation. To give you an opportunity physically to get out of your seat and to come and to pray with one of the deacons. I want, I want the deacons right now, wherever you are. Would you come forward, the deacons? Come and stand here. These are men and women chosen by you to be your spiritual leaders. And therefore, we invite you every Sunday to come and, and pray with them. Maybe you need to confess a sin. Maybe you need a prayer for a difficult situation in life. Maybe you've never been baptized. Come speak to me about being baptized, being a member of this church. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that you have given us wisdom on how we should fast. Not as an end in itself, but that we might love you more dearly and understand you more clearly and to give our hearts to you no matter what it costs. Our fathers, we give this invitation now if there are men and women who have never accepted you as Savior or those who need to rededicate their life to you, give them the courage to get up and come forward. Oh God, be with us. Oh Holy Spirit, speak to us this day. We ask in Jesus' name.